to be here today. And I'll ask our other panelists from Avi, Dronig, and Juan Sky to join the stage. Yeah, and right rather here. than me introducing everyone, I'll just say a couple of words about <laughs> myself. <laughs> I'm an editor with Air Traffic Management Magazine, and we are spending quite a bit of our time these days looking at UTM and UAM topics and the intersection with telecommunications. And maybe I could ask each of the panelists to spend one minute introducing yourself. Sure, I'll kick it off. Um, my name is Patrick. I'm the founder of AV. Uh, we are a drone plane manufacturer, uh, so a drone with wings, and, and we work for uh, um, yeah, a lot of emergency services, such as police, fire brigade. Uh, actually, many of the things you saw in the previous video, um, uh, we do, so connectivity is a big thing for us. My name is Ralf Schepp. Um, I'm managing director of Dronic. Dronic is a joint venture of uh, the German air traffic control and uh, Deutsche Telekom. And we are aiming to properly integrate safe and fairly drones into the airspace. I've done it again, but uh, Kapil Mittal, co-founder and CEO of Ericsson Drone Mobility. Uh, hi, my name is Chris Casera. I'm from OneSky. We're a traffic management company for drones. And out of uh, the United States, we're based in Pennsylvania. Uh, my background is I'm an aerospace engineer, and uh, I've worked in modeling simulation for my career, trying to understand communication uh, networks and how they can support these types of complex missions. Um, I'm also a pilot, and uh, I'm a co-founder of, of the company and looking for ways in which we can work with the cellular network and, uh, and the infrastructure it provides to help um, get drones to move beyond visual line of sight. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm Leif Bidwell from TDC in Denmark. Um, I am working in a joint 5G innovation hub between uh, TDC Net and Ericsson, where we are exploring future business cases around 5G and how technology can basically unleash new revenue for us as a telco. Thanks, everyone. So we've already heard some from Kapil and Leif about how uh, telecommunications and drones can work together. But I'd like to ask the other panelists from their perspective how they see uh, telecommunications playing a role in the world of drones. Would you like to go first, Patrick? Sure. For, yeah, for us, it's, it's vital. Um, uh, our aircraft fly usually 100 plus kilometers. Uh, meaning that there is no um, way to be able to just uh, use radio uh, communications that usually has a line of sight requirement. So we, we are dependent on different types of connectivity. Currently we use um, uh, multiple SIM cards, so we use LTE uh, combined with a satellite uh, a backup link. Uh, and even then it's, it's quite hard because um, from a compliance point of view uh, for the European regulators, we need to have a low latency, we have to need redundancy, so it's quite a complex topic actually, but very important. Okay, great. Ralph? We are working intensively on that one. Um, yeah, I think drones are, uh, telcos can do a lot into the drone business. Um, the main part I see is uh, really delivering a digital number plate, um, which is transferred via the mobile networks. This is, let's say, the entry door. Um, I see command and control over mobile networks. I see especially payload um, coming down from the drone, and I mean data, videos, photos um, in real time, um, to be also analyzed in real time. This is what we saw in the use cases with the fire brigades. It makes a lot of sense once they can fly beyond visual line of sight, and it makes a lot of sense if they send their data in real time to the ground, because then these, these kind of scenarios become effective. Um, there we are definitely not as of today. Yeah? So uh, this is quite a challenging setup. Um, what I also see is there is a lot of telecom data, which is quite useful for telcos. Kapil just mentioned. Um, there is uh, ground movement data, which is quite essential for calculating a, a ground risk assessment for drone flights. Um, what might also help uh, the customers is that we get an understanding how good the mobile network performs into the airspace because all of a sudden um, it is there by accident. Yeah, this is not 
the, the, the mobile network has not been built um, for serving airspace. Um, with some frequencies, it's not even allowed to cover the airspace. So this is really something we need to tackle in the future in order to make that a solid case. Chris, what about your perspective? Yeah, I, so I guess my the one thing I wanted to make clear is that there's this idea in aviation that it's aviation grade, you know, that an aircraft has something that's certified and uh, to pilots, it's expensive and burdensome for us to always buy that kind of equipment. So many people aren't visible to air traffic control when you go out and fly. And that's a big challenge for drones because drones shouldn't hit things that are flying. Uh, so getting people to participate um, can be much easier if they have cheaper, uh, more affordable ways to, uh, to comply. So what we're starting to see is regulator regulators looking at things like cell phones as ways that could be um, used as a transponder so that a pilot carrying a cell phone can just push a, a button, track me, and then that data goes to the air navigation service provider and everybody knows where that aircraft is. So what we need to do is get away from, uh, like you get on an airplane and it says don't use your cell phone, turn your cell phone off, it's going to harm aircraft. And thinking about, well, wait, this infrastructure is here and aviation is scared of using it. So how can we get away from the fear and adopt the infrastructure that is everywhere ubiquitous and can make aviation so much safer and a better experience? Great, thanks. So Ralph, I'm going to pick on you since uh, Dronig has the uh, parents coming from both the telecom and the air traffic control side. So when we talk about connectivity for drones, is it really just drones? What about everything else that's in the air? What about traditional aircraft, um, general aviation, urban air mobility, and even uh, there's a lot of conversation over in this stand about um, stratospheric. Uh, platforms. So how do you see telecoms reaching out beyond drones? I mean, you just mentioned them all, so what could I add, <laughs> <laughs> Claudia? But do you see a role in all of them, I guess, is the question. It's, it's quite a challenging field. Um, as Chris just mentioned, uh, for sure it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tiny idea to simply use a smartphone um, to getting yourself conspicuous and in dedicated airspaces to air traffic control. Um, this has also not been neglected by EASA and the European regulation. Um, so it's still as a means of compliance um, in place. But it also leaves some challenges behind. Yeah? It's not so easy to, s if the, the telcos are simply at the moment not even allowed to tell the pilots take a smartphone and not a certified device in your plane. Yeah? Because Merley of the spectrum licenses they own are, are built to the ground network. Yeah? They are just for terrestrial use. So this is something where still a little bit brain power needs to put in. Nevertheless, I think it's quite a good sign that especially EASA and also FAA um, did not exclude this kind of mobile story at all from their kind of agenda, but it's still in there, um, will be discussed, and uh, I think there will be a solution at the end which, which also fits to the market. Um, when it comes to high altitude platforms, I think that's quite, that's even more challenging. I think uh, called it somewhere in the R&D stage um, for quite a while. I mean, there are planes flying for quite a while in the stratospheric area, um, which would be theoretically um, good E-Node-B carriers um, in order to serve the ground. Um, some of these trials have been done by Deutsche Telekom, also British Telecom is working on that. Um, as far as I know, uh, you also, I even if it's not a technology challenge from a telco side, um, because it's line of sight direction, you can probably use normal spectrum to serve the ground from the air. Um, nevertheless, it's an, from the operating side, it's rather complicated. Yeah? You always need a constant fleet of drones up in the air circulating uh, over the country. Um, you need to, to travel over all, over all um, uh, airspaces, yeah? by a lower airspace through the regulated airspace. In regulated airspace, it's not even clear how unmanned systems are handled as of today um, from the air traffic controls um, up to the sky. 
And then we have uh, all these nice stories around air taxis and EV tolls. Um, I think they are an extremely good market accelerator because people love it. Everyone has the nice idea to fly to his office in the morning and not stuck in traffic jam on the ground. Uh, we've all seen nine elements. Um, so there's a lot of emotion in there um, and would be the right time now to, to, to end up this emotional story and to really come up with a, um, with a solid plan, which they do, the manufacturers. Um, but you can imagine that these kind of aircraft need a lot more capacity that it can be delivered today by the networks per accident from the ground network. So there's still some work to do. Great. Uh, Kapil, what about 5G? Do we need 5G to have you successful <laughs> connectivity? And what about all the places that won't have 5G? You know, when we talk about 5G, you know, we always think about uh, having a nice experience and we, radio comes to our mind. But 5G is not only radio, it's also radio in the core. So the functionality which we showcased uh, in terms of network exposure, same density, they're only in 5G now. And I understand uh, the 5G coverage is not ubiquitous currently. And I think that's where the interplay of what is in the 5G core now and the 4G radio plays very well. In all, all our trials with the networks now, whether it's in Denmark, uh, Germany, Sweden, operators have been using their 4G network very effectively currently, uh, along with the 5G core. We do believe, though, that you know, as the drone ecosystem evolves, the business systems evolve, 5G coverage will also evolve. Another thing point uh, you know, worthwhile to mention is uh, even 3GPP is working on uh, specific standards that would make the 5G performance uh, for drones even better. So that can also be handled. So in a nutshell, we can only start with 4G as a coverage, start leveraging what we have as 5G core, and uh, you know, marry the best of both worlds. And that's what the mobile operators are pretty much trying to monetize. OK, thanks. So when you talk about cellular connectivity to drones, there's part of the industry that will bring up satellite connectivity to the drones. So Patrick, how would you see LEOs or low um, Earth orbit satellites playing a role in drone connectivity? Yeah, that's an, an, an interesting topic, actually. So what we see currently is um, the last couple of years, uh, I think, unfortunately, a lot of um, parties wanted to develop their own networks, uh, whereas there's a, there's a great uh, telecommunication network. Uh, but that's not everywhere. Uh, we do a lot of operations in Africa as well, where there simply is no LTE coverage. Um, so we rely on another link. And um, maybe the current way drones are seen is not uh, all the way aviation uh, certified uh, or air grade, but it's getting very close to it. So that means that you need always some form of redundancy and multiple systems. So I actually think that the solution here is a combination of systems where satellite comes in play as well. And I've been talking to many different satellite providers, but um, I'm actually a bit disappointed in how little uh, or, or little is going on there yet. Um, this is going to be a, a huge market uh, already in a couple of years where we will see th hundreds of thousands of drones flying long distances for emergency services for many other applications that require backup links. Um, a lot of people know um, what low orbital satellite system is due to Starlink, that there's many more uh, uh, like that. Um, it would have the ability to have lower latency, which is, again, important. You cannot wait uh, for seconds if something happens with the drones and you have to respond quickly. So I hope that development uh, will increase the next couple of years in both uh, segments, be fused together uh, so we have a reliable, redundant and low latency, high bandwidth system. Sorry, a lot of features we need. Yeah. Great. I want to build on this question with you, Leif. How do you see satellite and a telecom coexisting or not? Or who's primary, who's secondary? How do you see that playing? I would see uh, telco as a primary. But as Patrick said, uh, there will probably be room for satellites as well. It will be different across markets. Uh, so as I'm from Denmark, it's a fairly small, flat country. We already have full blanket 5G coverage. Uh, so we are ready already today to do um, quite good, uh, provide quite good experiences as soon as we have the details ready here. Um, but it will be very different in other countries, I fully admit that. 
And on top, I would um, be a firm believer that using, uh, using what we have today, we will have far better capacity, so we'll have what will be required to handle swarms of drones if and when that gets in place, where um, the satellites, they will still have limited bandwidth. It's magnificent what they're able to do with Starlink and others today, especially in rural areas, but you won't rely on that in a dense city because it's not enough. So we have the cap capacity for it, we have the density in the grid, um, and on top of that, I also believe that we will be better for drones flying in less or high altitude. So you, when you're closer on the ground, if you are in areas with buildings, then you will get significant challenges with the satellites, unless you put really chunky uh, radios on your drone as well, and you want to keep weight down. So that's also where, with the 3 p technology, we can provide extremely small modems to allow the drone to communicate. Thanks. So Chris, OneSky works with uh, organizations globally. So can you share with us, as you talk with um, your clients and their mobile net MNOs, excuse me, and their MNOs, what synergies and differences you're seeing in different geographies? Sure, yeah, and I, just to build on the, the last question, you know, the concept of satellite versus cellular isn't just communication. And when we're looking at cellular, we're looking at a variety of services, including things like population density. So how do we stay away from events where there's lots of people? Or how do we understand um, GPS accuracy and validating that with, uh, with other network capabilities, triangulating position and things like that. that. That might be something that it's challenging for a satellite to do. So you might find more services on a telco and then less services as you scale to a satellite, um, even including bandwidth. So I think it's not a one-to-one, -one, but it's probably backing into something. When we work with customers, uh, first of all, the regulator wants to know that that drone has command and control capability, um, but it's up to the operator to pick the capability they want to use. I believe that cellular is ubiquitous and we should be using it. Um, in many cases, though, we find that the network isn't exposing enough information. So think about coverage. How do we understand coverage? Most of us go to the internet and we look it up and we see a map, and it's based on empirical data collected on the ground. It's not based on flying around drones and figuring out what it is in the air. So we're already starting out from, from poor information, and we're trying to enhance that communication with the cellular uh, operators to share, um, to share, to expose information to UTM companies and help us provide um, flight plans so we, can, so we can validate those flight plans and make sure that they're flying safe, safely on the network. And that's part of what ACJA and GSMA is doing, is trying to um, find ways to expose the cellular network metrics so that the, the operators can fly safely. But what we're seeing right now is people flying based on maps that have already been produced for ground-based behavior. They're using LTE. They might be using it without the network's uh, uh, approval, even. And the network might even not know that they're flying on the network. Mm -hmm. so, it, it's still very R&D days right now, but I think we're moving in the right direction. You mentioned ACJA, and maybe everyone in the audience doesn't know the acronym, so could yeah, you so explain what that is? <laughs> the ACJA is the Aerial Connectivity Joint Activity, a little bit of a mouthful, but it's between GSMA and GUTMA, which is the Global UTM Association. So as a UTM company, we're part of GUTMA, and I serve as the technical lead for ACJA. Uh, Barbara is, is also co-lead with with me, and uh, there's a lot of other members here that work on the working group, like Thomas, working group two, uh, responsible for exposing that network behavior over things like GSMA is working on Open Gateway and Kamara. How do you expose network information to a UTM company so that we can help manage that flight successfully? Even to the point where if you're flying a drone, you could uh, change um, the amount of bandwidth that that drone gets or enhance the performance uh, on the network if it's experiencing um, bad performance, right? So there's ways that you can do that now using the existing interfaces that um, have been created through the Open Gateway project. Thank you. Um, Ralph, of course we hope the drones stay where they should stay in the air, but how do we identify the possible ground risk of drones and uh, who do you see as responsible for doing that? 
There is a certain responsibility uh, which comes from, uh, the, at least in Europe, from the member states, um, as they give you the so-called U.S. geo zones. Um, within these geo zones, it's, you have a clearly mapped kind of pattern where you can see where are dangerous areas where you should not fly over at all and uh, where it's more unrisky to fly. And except for every drone flight, you need some kind of a security risk assessment, which uh, includes air-to-air -air risks, so that pl planes and drones don't, cra don't crash into each other, and uh, the ground risk. And for ground risk purposes, um, there are quite good solutions on the market which take data from the telco networks, which visualize uh, where the mass of the people are. Um, some of the mobile operators also offer APIs based on that. Um, I remember to have seen that from Proximus in Belgium, for instance. Um, you can actually puzzle together quite nice tools from that APIs, um, which then tells you uh, you're not allowed to fly over crowded areas. Um, this should be dealt with in ideally real time, and the only way to identify where are people in real time down to the ground is, let's say, by, by using the intelligence of a mobile network. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Right now, we're all running hard towards BV loss or beyond visual line of sight, but we still have a pilot flying that drone. So, Patrick, do you envision a future where we actually have autonomous drones like autonomous cars? <laughs> and what would be needed? Um, well, this is it. What we see usually in, in, in aviation is that um, a, a lot of the regulators don't like to talk about autonomy, so they say usually um, ultimately automated. Um, uh, so the difference is a bit in between um, does a drone think for itself or does it have certain program backup steps? Now, where we're currently at is that we can do fully remote operations, so you don't have a pilot on site anymore uh, but in a command and control center located wherever you want, as long as you're connected to the cloud. Um, you, I think the whole industry is getting to a point where you can minimize the, uh, the, the amount of work required for a certain operation. So I think it actually the, the role here is less a drone pilot, but more a like an air traffic controller. It's more like a drone traffic controller, uh, um, uh, well, monitoring multiple flights. Again, what is required to be able to do that is uh, 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 having a really good awareness of the actual situation. And again, connectivity comes in play there. So it cannot be that there are too long latencies to be able to uh, respond to a certain incident or a situation. Um, but I actually think that, that one very um, important point of view uh, or very important variable is going to be the um, uh, the liability at some point, because the more we automate the drones, um, the, the more it will happen that the incident actually occurs from uh, the drone making a certain decision, whereas in all the regulation right now, the pilot or the flight operator is still the responsible and therefore liable person. So it's going to be interesting uh, topic as well. Okay, great. Um, Chris, my favorite question, cybersecurity. So we uh, know that there's some level of cyber already built into the telecommunications network. Do you th believe that there's something additional needed? If so, what? And who would be responsible for that? Um, let me just flip the question around a little bit and give you some understanding of how fly pilots fly today using VHF communications and voice and if I'm going to talk to air traffic control, I push a button, I start talking, and then somebody else pushes a button, and now we immediately are crushing each other. We're, we're jamming each other. This is how safety works today on manned aircraft as we fly 747s, right? So when we talk about cybersecurity, it's kind of interesting. We're expecting a lot more from a drone because the technology seems better, but the reality is that um, it already is so much more secure than what we experience in aviation. And there's other types of things that we do beyond what's available on cellular, um, you know, to, to help with security, and that would be, you know, like a UTM functions over HTTPS and um, all, the, all the different things that we can do to get data from one place to another and encrypt it um, that, that helps. But cybersecurity is important, but I would say that um, knowing where we're coming from, I think we're, we're already well beyond where traditional aviation is. 
And maybe everyone didn't want to know that tidbit before Sorry. they get on their flights home tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, Leif, what can drones do for telecom? Let's flip the conversation the other side around. How can drones help telecom providers? Well, of course, um, one thing is that we are all, uh, all looking for new, uh, new potential sources of revenue, and these are, it's, it feels to be fairly close to our home turf. It's still different, so we def definitely need partners in order to tap into uh, and understand their specific needs. But as has been uh, discussed here today as well, we do have uh, different key assets already today that we can reutilize and kind of mint to attract this kind of new business. So that's, of course, one thing. The other thing is um, also that, uh, practical that we can sort of take our own medicine to. Um, so part of creating and maintaining our networks is a lot of infrastructure. So as any other infrastructure owner, we also need to, uh, to keep that uh, network up and running best way possible. So another part of it is that we ourselves will be um, quite uh, heavy drone users to rely on for site inspection, site acceptance, and to, to understand our network better. As has also been pointed out, that the traditional mapping for our mobile networks have been focused on our existing users on the ground. So we also, we have a need to understand this and we have a need to be able to com communicate it. So we are ourselves a central customer of what we want to bring to the market. Great, Kapil, could you answer the same question? Yeah, I think, of course, you know, from a usage perspective, there are so many things uh, that the drones are currently getting it on. I mean, if you look at um, ourselves from Ericsson, we do approximately 50 to 60,000 site inspections every year. And within Ericsson, we're trying to replace them all with drones. So it adds a lot of efficiency, it adds to real-time inventory, it adds to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, also something which is very near to Ericsson is uh, Target Zero, where your fatalities in terms of climbing is also reduced. So you can always expand the horizon where drones are getting used, and um, it's about, you know, eating your own dog food uh, in terms of when you're creating a platform, and you mentioned about security uh, as well to Chris earlier. All these platforms that we're building up is uh, telco grade security. So your data is absolutely secured, whether you are putting it on the public cloud, but the way you're capturing is absolutely secured. I kind of agree with the, what uh, Leif said. Um, I think it's enormous there. And what about... May, may I add something to that? Yes, please <coughs> do. <laughs> I, think the, I think the biggest wealth drone can do to telcos is to tell them where they are and what they do. I think this is a really missing link. Um, we are in a phase today where a telco cannot differentiate, is this a flying UE or is this a ground-based device? Um, anyhow, if it's flying, it causes certain network interrogations and interferences. Um, the worst case which can happen to the telco industry is that they leave this kind of business alone and that every, every drone operator at the end acquires his SIM card in a normal shop um, using a san standard SIM card for a standard network, um, then the telco will have a lot to do. Yeah. So the best way would be the drone would say uh, the, the SIM card would say, "Hey, I'm in a drone, and these are my conditions under which I fly." Yeah? I want to hear the same answer from the others, but I also want to come back to uh, Leaf and, and maybe Kapil with something. What about helping um, deploy networks in rural areas? I had a meeting with here, someone here at the show that was talking about using drones to um, think of it as creating a 5G mesh network in areas where there was no um, ability to deploy towers. So think of the drones as towers and having them um, connect over an area where you need either interim connectivity, whether it's a disaster situation or even a large event, or someplace rural where there's no other way to get there. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, You're yeah, nodding. Yeah, you know, I, I can take it as well. I mean, that concept has been discussed for quite some time. And uh, long back, in fact, AT&T started in US uh, something called Cell on Wheels. You know, putting nice small base stations on top of drones and getting it on. I think the challenge with that is uh, trying to understand uh, is it really useful or what kind of uh, interference does it create for the, for the ecosystem. But yes, uh, that's definitely in the fray. We've been in discussion with the drone manufacturers as well now. 
where uh, there's a discussion happening with some of them to put uh, small base stations on top of it. And uh, those would be absolutely fantastic, especially where there is less coverage or no coverage or uh, disaster relief. So uh, we believe, I think, with the more 3 GPP standards getting standardized, uh, this will be a reality in the near future. Leif, anything additional? It hasn't been a strong focus from our point of view. Again, we are sort of uh, lucky to be the small country with already blanket coverage. Of course, for emergencies, stuff could happen to us as well. Um, but it definitely requires a lot of groundwork to be able to, it's, it's not only to uh, put a minimized E-Node B on top of a drone and have that flying. We'll need to ensure solutions where we can support this continuously. So obviously drones are still limited on flight time. Um, so it's, um, it's a very interesting and intriguing idea, to be honest. Um, but it's definitely not been anything that we've considered in this project. And okay. power. Yeah. Not only flight time, but also power to radiate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, most of these flying cells are tethered, actually. Yeah, that's what I was going to yeah. say. The AT&T cow, the cell on wings, is tethered. Right. And I know Verizon also has a tethered drone. And uh, the, honestly, the conversation that I had was actually related to um, eVTOL and urban air mobility vehicles carrying base stations, not the smaller drones. So um, I guess watch this space. So Chris, what do you think? What can drones do for telecom? I mean, all those are, are uh, interesting use cases. Drones for telecom sell on wings. Um, but, you know, there's some other use cases, I guess, uh, inspection of towers has been uh, brought up. So um, then you look at things like drone in a box where right now um, it's still hard to do beyond visual line of sight. But if you could get to remote operations, that, that business case could really help, I think, telecoms understand what's mounted on the tower and inspecting uh, people that are putting different hardware on those towers. Um, that's probably another use case we didn't talk about. Patrick, your thoughts? Well, I think uh, network coverage checks as well. So uh, because we are uh, relying on network connectivity, um, to be able to fly BVLOS, we first chop up a certain mission in short flights that are within visual line of sight to be able to measure the network coverage on these altitudes. Um, we could also give that data back, of course, to the telcos. Uh, uh, and by um, mapping then out what, a, uh, wh what it looked like would be helpful. Although we actually see it's, it's way more dynamic than we thought. We thought it was quite static up there, but it's not. Uh, so it's a changing environment, but who knows? Okay. And that's um, something maybe to explain uh, a little bit to people in the audience is if you think about your cellular coverage and you think about your handoffs as you move around with your smartphone, now you think about that a drone is relying on that coverage that they move around. Um, there's a whole, I guess I would say, wide range of solutions coming in the market that actually do what Patrick's talking about, where companies go out and they map the um, information and then they let the telecoms know, well, you might have a gap here or you might have coverage on the ground here but not high in the air, so think about where you're pointing your 5G, and so this is, a, I guess, a new market opportunity that's happening. Yeah, for all the entrepreneurs here. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs>